Scale It Up Nation, most of us have on our to-do list to read more. But the fact of the matter is, we can only read a book when we are in the right place to read a book. And we are in our cars an awful lot. That's why Audible is such a powerful tool to make sure that you are staying up to date on the latest information, newest trends, and how to make your day-to-day better by having Audible read your books to you. Turn your car time into classroom time and get to reading all those books that you have on your list. Go to our affiliate link, scalinguph2o.com forward slash audible to get a free book and a free month so you can see why I've been using Audible for years. Welcome to Scaling Up H2O, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. I'm Trace Blackmore, the host of the Scaling Up H2O podcast. And Nation, can you believe it? This is our 294th show. Now, I know if you've been a longtime listener of the show, you know we are well into the 300s. But for some reason, I tried to label all of the shows very weird in the beginning, and I did like a 12.1 to 12.2 and nobody cared about that they just wanted a number i guess that just goes to show you whenever you try to do something new you are going to learn along the way and when you try to do something new publicly like give a podcast to an industry Publicly, you can see when I made not the best decisions. So we just decided instead of going back and renumbering all those old episodes, we would just run with it. So officially 294 episodes, and I am just amazed at that number. I remember my very first time I sat in front of a microphone, and it wasn't even a microphone. It was my Bluetooth headset, and I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to say it, and I surely did not think that anybody would ever listen to it. Well, Nation, I am sure glad I got over that initial fear Because I didn't know this, but doing this podcast would become the thing that I look forward to most. It was the thing that scared me the most, and it was the thing that put me in front of people that I didn't know, I didn't know the most. I love it when people come up to me and they let me know that they enjoy this podcast. They tell me something they did because of this podcast. And when I think back of how scared I was when I had that Bluetooth headset on and how bad episode number one was, I'm sure glad that I battled through that because I look forward to speaking to you each and every week, and I so much look forward to meeting all the people that I meet because of this podcast. We've got almost 20,000 listeners in over 90 countries now. It is amazing. We've been rated in the top 5% of podcast, which is just baffling to me. And it's all because of all the work that you are doing. The fact that you listen to this podcast is amazing. It was my hope that my wife would listen to this podcast, by the way. She doesn't. I was just hoping that somebody would give me a like on social media. I think she's listened to a couple, and I think she's liked some of our social media posts, but I didn't expect too much more than that. So the stats I just gave you are just amazing to me. Thank you for all of you out there being part of what we call the Scaling Up Nation. And it's my hope that as we continue another 300 plus episodes, that you let me know what you want me to talk about. You've heard me use this drill every single podcast. I want to make sure we've got plenty of information to share with you 
So feel free to share that information with us by going to scalinguph2o.com. Go over to our show ideas section and you can tell us all about it. You can also leave a voicemail by clicking the leave voicemail button. And if it's a question, we might use your question to open up that part of the show and then answer that question. Maybe I might answer it. Maybe we'll get another expert in the field to answer it. But we'll never answer it if you don't ask it. So again, that's scalinguph2o.com. Go over to our show ideas page. And speaking of ideas, as you know, a great idea to have is how are you going to increase your knowledge? So we have lots of ways to do that on the show, and we're going to talk about that. But first off, if you are in the field of water treatment that I am in, you want to go to the Association of Water Technologies Technical Training Seminars. You've got two opportunities for that, February 21st through 23rd in San Diego, California, and then another one, March 29th through April 1st in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Folks, I've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. It is my favorite thing to do all year for so many reasons. One, I'm very active in the technical training seminar, but I also get to meet so many of you. So I hope to meet you at one of these technical training seminars. And if you want to learn more about them, you can go to scalinguph2o.com and go over to our events page. I will tell you that time is running out if you want to go to the San Diego, California installment, and then you have a little bit more time for the Pittsburgh installment of that training. I hope to see you there. And something that always gets asked to me is, can I take my certified water technologist exam at that venue? Now, for those of you that have been involved with the CWT or with the Association of Water Technologies for a longer period of time, you remember we always wrapped up the technical training seminars with that exam. Well, folks, that was back when it was a paper exam. And we don't have that anymore. We have it so much easier on you where you can sleep in your own bed the night before. You in your own hometown can schedule when you take the exam. And we've got all of that information available for you on a free CWT prep course. So what I've done I've created a CWT prep course that is going to build your confidence around taking the Certified Water Technologist examination. And I've created a free version of that course where I go through everything you need to know about taking the exam, about signing up for the exam, about studying for the exam about making sure that you're scheduling things properly. So how much is that going to cost you? Well, that is completely free. You can go straight to scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep, and you can take that free course. Now, here's the thing. That is the first few sections of the paid course And the paid course will give you a hundred questions to sort of get you into the flavor of what to expect when you sit for your CWT and boost your confidence so you can take the exam. I firmly believe we have so many future CWTs out there but they do not have the confidence to sit and take the exam. I fully believe if they did, they would pass the examination. So it's my hope that you get a little bit more confidence to do what you need to do so you can sign up for that Certified Water Technologist Examination 
and become one of the elite in the industrial water treatment industry and get your certified water technologist designation. Once again, that's scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep. Nation, you might remember a few weeks back, I was talking to my friend Scott on episode 292, and he challenged me with reading more books this year. And of course, when I say reading, I'm talking about listening. And how am I listening to it? I'm talking about Audible and listening at a higher rate. Well, I'm about a month and a half into that experiment. And let me tell you, Scott was right. I am now well over two times speed, depending on the author. I'm either at 2.3 to 2.7, depending on how the author is naturally speaking. And I have good retention. So hopefully you've joined me in that challenge to see if you can read more books this year. And it's not how fast you read them. It's the information that you're retaining from them. So don't just put it on 11,000 speed to say that you did it. Make sure you're actually getting something out of it. There are several people that have joined me in this challenge, and that's always so much fun for me to hear that people are actually listening to what I'm trying, and they're trying that out for themselves. And if you do not have a subscription to Audible, you can get a free month and a free book by going to our affiliate page, and that's scalinguph2o.com forward slash Audible. Now, let me give you a little bit of warning. If that is the first time you're listening to Audible, do not increase it any more than the default, which is a one-time speed. Just get used to listening to books audibly. That takes a little bit of practice. And then once you get used to that, you can take this challenge along with me and so many other people in the Scaling Up Nation And I wonder what number I'm going to hit this year. Now, it's not about the number for me. It's about what I'm able to learn, what I'm able to determine I didn't know I didn't know. And you hear me say that all the time. That's something I'm always looking for. What information do I not know that I don't know? And reading is the best way that I have found to do that other than making sure I'm in rooms with other people that are teaching me things I didn't know that I didn't know. So a great way to do that is to read. And a great way to read when you are a busy water treater is by Audible. And again, you can get a free book and a free month by going to scalinguph2o.com forward slash audible. Nation, I feel this podcast is all about learning and challenging ourselves. And somebody that helps us do this each and every week is our friend James McDonald. And here is another installment of Periodic Water Table with James. Hello and welcome to the Periodic Water Table with James where we think and learn about water chemistry drop by drop. Please use your week to search online, ask your colleagues, or even pick up a book to learn more about each week's periodic water table topic. If you do, at the end of the year, you'll be 52 water chemistry smarter. So let's raise the water table of knowledge together and get started. Today's topic is... Sodium hypochlorite, or bleach. What is the concentration difference between retail and industrial sodium hypochlorite? What is the shelf life of it? What can make sodium hypochlorite degrade? What is its chemical formula? What happens to sodium hypochlorite when it mixes with water? How does it impact microorganisms? What are common usage concentrations for sodium hypochlorite? Does demand versus residual mean anything? What about free versus total residuals? How high does its concentration have to be in water before you can start smelling it? What is the reservoir effect? How do you test for sodium hypochlorite in the field? Will high sodium hypochlorite levels impact the test? How may the presence of ammonia impact sodium hypochlorite applications? 
Remember, knowledge is power, and taking the time to learn more about water chemistry each week will help make you a force to be reckoned with. Be sure to post what you learn to social media and tag it with hashtag WaterTable23 and hashtag ScalingUpH2O. I look forward to learning more from you. James, thank you for that. Nation, it's always amazing all the things that James McDonald helps out with. And James teaches us all the time, what do we not know we do not know? And James has got a book out there. We talk about it a little bit on this show, but it's called Drop by Drop. We'll have a link. You can go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash drop by drop, and that will be an affiliate link straight to his book. I'm sure James would appreciate it if you check that out. There is so much information in there about our field of water treatment. A lot of people don't know that it exists. So there you go. James McDonald has written a book, and it's been out for a while, and it doesn't read like a story, but it's all his technical bulletins that he has put together over the years. It's a great resource for me, and I've got to be honest, and James knows this, when I couldn't think of a topic, I would just randomly open his book, and whatever I turned to, that became a Scaling Up H2O podcast episode. So James, thank Thank you for giving me a magic eight ball for somehow deciding on what content we were going to talk about in the early years. James is such a help to the Scaling Up H2O podcast. Well, Nation, here is our interview. My lab partner today is John Mullen, Director of Technical Services of IAPMO. John, welcome to the Scaling Up H2O podcast. Hey, how you doing, Trace? Doing great. So you and I met briefly at the Association of Water Technologies Conference. You did a roundtable conversation up in the, the middle of the big room and shared that you were a fourth generation plumber. How about that? Yes, sir. That was a good experience getting up there, talking to the crowd, water treaters. It was great to be in the room. It was nice to be invited. It was a great presentation, and I love presentations by people like yourself because it's not just theoretical data. It's, this is what I know. This is what is going on because I experienced it. Yeah, that's a lot of what I try to bring to the, to the table. You know, I'm trying to bring my past experiences here as a plumber and um, you know, involve all the other aspects of what it is we do it's in the built environment with the plumbing, mechanical you know, when it comes to the engineers, everybody involved, right down to the end users, you know, trying to get everybody on the same page, talking to one another. Let's talk about IATMO for a second, because that's an acronym that people are probably aware of, especially with the uh, ASSC 12,080. But in case people don't know about that, what is IATMO? So IATMO is the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials. IATMO does a lot of different things uh, for, the, for the industry, but we're really uh, an industry partner. We are the secretariat of the Uniform Plumbing Codes and Uniform Mechanical Codes. So um, those documents are produced by IATMO um, through our committees and, and whatnot, through the ANSI process. We also do a lot of R&T work. We do education work. Um, we're really here to just support the trades you know, and support, support the plumbing industry as a whole. So, and then you all partnered up with a couple of different people and you created some training around the ASSE 12,080. How did that come to be? Well, the industry needed it. I mean, there's been a lot of issues with Legionella throughout the country. I mean, it's been on the rise. I mean, people know about it now. It's, it's in the news all the time. So there was, a, there was definitely a need for education. So it started with the clinicians, people in, in hospitals and things like that in the ICRA side of the business. And then it started trickling its way down through the facility directors and down to the plumbers. And, and there's a need to understand the, uh, the risks that are associated with our plumbing system. So this program came out to kind of get everybody in the same room, talking about all the situations, all the issues, learning from one another. And it's, a, it's been a great tool. I mean, it's really expanded throughout the industry and people are really widely accepting it as the premium training for water management systems. How many people do you know, and you, maybe you don't have this data, that have become certified? I don't have that data off the top of my head, but um, I know it's growing every single day. Um, I know it's starting to make its way in certain legislations and things like that, and it's, uh, it's, it's getting there. Yeah, and we, we appreciate you guys doing all that you do, especially sharing that with the Association of Water Technologies like you did just a couple of months ago. 
Let me ask about your job as the director of technical services. What is your day-to-day like? Well, I do a lot of different things. So it's a pretty diverse role. So time management is definitely required. So um, utilizing systems is kind of how I get through my day. So I kind of break it down to some buckets. You know, that I'm an organized guy. <laughs> this is kind of what I do. I like to break things down into lean, actionable ways of handling my day. <laughs> and the way I've grouped my things into uh, internal work, external work, and, and deep and focused work. So the internal work is really what I do primarily at IATMO, my bread and butter work, which is uh, running the innovation task groups as staff liaison. So I'm working with the hydrogen piping task group, the medical gas resiliency pi- uh, task group, and the construction practices for potable water. I'm also uh, working with the water demand calculator group, which is working on some really interesting stuff coming down the pike. And then um, I work on the external stuff as well. So I engage with similar groups outside of my organization, try to break down those walls and open source good information, really just build relationships with others in the industry and uh, just make sure we're all working together. And then the other portion is my, my deep and focus work, which is really my, my writing, my public engagement, my online engagement, attending technical trainings, keeping myself sharp, watching the trends and uh, just hanging out with the industry leaders, just trying to understand what it is that we can do to help them. So for somebody listening out there that wants to find out more about IATMO, maybe become a member, who should be a member of IATMO? Well, it starts with the plumbing apprentices. I mean, a lot of times the the apprentice programs um, are now including the IATMO membership with their apprentice, uh, apprenticeship because it's it's good training on the codes. Our codes are model codes in the, throughout the country where we offer a lot of different services with the membership service. And then where can you direct people to go if they want to learn more? Sure. If you'd like to learn more, you could check out um, uniformcodes.org. That's a great place to learn more about what we're doing. Or um, the Authority Podcast is another great place to check out the things that we're working on currently at IAMO. Excellent. So we're all curious, what are some of the projects that you guys are working on for 2023? 2023 is going to be a big year. So um, we got a lot coming up. Got some some major projects going on with IATMO with the water demand calculator. We're trying to scale that project out towards the commercial and healthcare sector. So we're working with a lot of different partners in the industry on data collection, aggregation, and trying to work on right-sizing pump plumbing systems to make sure that they're safe. So we're working on that internally. And uh, another big one that I've been involved with personally has been the hydrogen piping task group, which is in a Another interesting trend to follow as uh, our country goes through some energy transitions, we're starting to see this become a trend. So we want to make sure that we have the right language in our code book to make sure the installations are safe. Let's talk a little bit about that because I'm sure there are several listeners that are unclear what you're talking about with hydrogen piping. What's going on? Why do we need codes around that? Like any gas, I mean, you're going you're gonna to want some codes, some language in terms of leak detection, materials for joints and things of that nature. There's all types of corrosion issues when it comes to hydrogen gas specifically that have to be taken into consideration, have to be fully understood before they just make their way into buildings. So right now, it seems to be the trend is talking about blending. They're talking about blending natural gas with hydrogen. Right now, it seems like 20% seems to be the max of which they can do without there being major impacts on the existing piping systems. So it seems like the, the, the industry is playing around with those ideas of blends, and we have to be ready for it. There'll be, there'll be a pertinent changes, like uh, I imagine valves and you know, different types of connectors and leak detections and quick connects, stuff like that will, will be a little different from the, the natural gas or the steel products that we're currently working with. But you know, we're here to kind of follow those trends, work with the manufacturers, work with the engineers, and uh, just make sure when it does come down the pike and it starts making its way into buildings, the plumbers know what they're doing, the inspectors know what to look for, and ultimately it's safe to occupy the buildings. So you know, that, that's the goal. It's just talking it through. Your family's been in the plumbing business for four generations. I know you guys get together. It's got to be a plumbing conversation every Thanksgiving. So I'm curious, uh, when we look back at your family, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen over the generations or that your family has seen over the generations? Yeah, I mean, plumbing only recently has hit this new stride, I feel like. You know, um, there's, there's been a lot of stagnant growth, I would say, in terms of like new age products throughout the last couple of decades. I mean, piping has been what it is. With new things coming out like plastics and different technologies around fire stopping, you know, there's, been, there's a lot of digitalization of, of things. It's really been kind of what I've been watching. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy the making, making things smarter <laughs> and um, automated. I like the idea of automating products and automating plumbing systems, collecting data. Watching the systems virtually is, uh, is a pretty cool thing to see in terms of the change that occurred. But it, it almost seems like it happened overnight. 
you know, it, it seems like a lot of the things my father taught me when I was a kid, I used right up through my apprenticeship and I was pouring lead joints in my, in my fifth year. So, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, and that wasn't that long ago. So it's been an exp- exponential growth, I would say over the past 10 years, 10 to 15 years. And it's, a, it's been really cool to watch, you know, there's been a lot of innovation. Did you know growing up, that's what you were going to do? No, growing up, I, I did not want to be a plumber. No, I wasn't even sure I wanted to be a plumber when I was an apprentice, to be honest with you. I, I, I strayed away from the path a few times and uh, something always brought me back in. You know, it's just, it's, it's been my life. My, <laughs> it's been something I was born into and it is, it is hard to get away from, you know, you, there's a love there for it. It's a passion for, for, for doing what we do and building things. So it's hard to get away from it. <laughs> do you think there'll be a generation five? I hope so. You know, I'm, I, I, have a, I have a son and a daughter, and uh, both of them seem interested in engineering and, um, and buildings and all the things that I talk about around the house. And we build things together here at home. And I keep them engaged in all sorts of different types of, uh, you know, learning and engineering aspects of, uh, you know, the world we, we basically built, you know, the ones our family built. So it's, it's, it's cool to, to share that knowledge with them. And hopefully they, uh, they want to continue it. But ultimately, it's up to them. So at the AWT, you shared a wealth of knowledge. Question I have for you is how do us industrial water treaters work better with folks like you to make sure that we are getting the best product to the customer, that things are designed correctly, that things are operated correctly? How can we do that job better together? I would just say... um Participation is is really key right now. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on with committees and task groups and all this. It, it's actually it's really um, it's great to see. I mean, there's a, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of people working on a lot of different projects, and nobody's certain which one to go towards. But the participation is the most important part. Getting people to actually come to these tables and sit with these groups and talk to people and hear the other sides of of what they do. You know, the the other people it affects, the ripple effects, and and how one thing you do may affect the next group or not to set them up for success somehow. And it, it's great to actually get everybody in the right rooms, talking to one another about the same topics. So I would say participate, get involved in some of these local committees, join a local group, join an international group. I mean, IATMO has innovation task groups that run every couple months for about a year at a time. And it's volunteer. You, you come in, it's, it's all virtual. It's on Zoom. It's actually a lot of fun. We, we sit there, we chat, we come up with different things. Um, Some people choose to be writers, some people choose to be reviewers, but at the end of the day, we all help. We all help move this industry forward and provide some real actionable guidance for for the people out there in the field. You obviously have a passion for creating content. Can you tell us a little bit about Throw a Wrench in Your Plans? Well, Throw a Wrench in Your Plans is actually a, it's a book idea I came up with in 2019. So, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, as an apprentice, I wasn't even sure I wanted to stay with plumbing. I, you know, I've been doing it all, all my life. I, I, I veered off. I went down different paths. And the whole idea of this book is to basically explain that there's more options than just being a plumber when you, when you learn the trade. There's a lot that people don't understand. There's estimation, there's drafting, there's healthcare, there's engineering, there's data center management. There's all these different things that I've, and I've met so many people throughout the past decade or so who have started as a plumber or their father was a plumber and they used to do side work with them and it taught them some things that they were able to take with them into their next career. And it's really interesting to see the trade and, and where you can go with it. So I, I want to I tell those stories. You know, my, my story is an interesting one. So my story will be in there as well. But uh, the whole idea is to, to help publish other people's stories and, and get them out there for the benefit of the next generation of plumbers. So if people did want to just consume all the content that you create, where can they find that? Well, I like to play on social media. So you'll see me a lot on social media, but that's my private stuff. I do a lot of that stuff. That's my voice speaking, um, not through IATMO. But again, um, I do the best I can to represent the industry as a whole and be there to help everybody. So I, you can find me on social media and um, uniformcodes.org. But you'll see a lot of my technical writing and hopefully some other publications throughout the next couple of years. A lot of people are trying to create content. That is definitely how people are getting known in their industry these days. Do you have any tips for our listeners on how you create content? I really just play, to be honest with you. (laughs) I enjoy enjoy the play with it. I, I, I try to treat it as less of a job and just have more fun with sharing interesting things that I find. With so much exposure to everything all at once, it's really hard to get 
good information or, or interesting stuff. You know, it's all thrown at us <laughs> in this new way of the internet. You know, so it's, you know, if you follow me, you'll, you'll, you'll hear the latest news in plumbing. You'll hear about different things that are going on in the trades. And, uh, you know, hopefully I could be a resource for people in, the, in that way. And that's kind of what I tried to do. And I, I'm just sharing all the things I care about. Um, you know, it's, it's the projects I'm working on. You know, it's the love of that, the love of building. It's, you know, you'll, you'll see my family on there. You'll see a little personal stuff. I mean, I, uh, I try to just be authentically me. And um, I want people to realize that I'm an accessible guy in this industry. I want people to know that they can actually talk to me and call me and ask me a question about plumbing, even if, you know, <laughs> even if they don't know me. I, I want to be a resource for the industry in any way that I can. And, and I realize that there's so many different levels of this industry now. Even talking to your side of the business and the water treatment side, you know, you guys need people to talk to in the plumbing world too. So it, it's great for us to be crossing these paths and talking to one another and just constantly making sure that we know that we're accessible. So I think that's kind of the goal of me being out there on social media and trying to be a, you know, a, a face for the industry in a sense. So I love it. That's awesome. As somebody that also tries to create content, I'm curious, do you have goals that you want to do so many posts over a particular moment in time? Do you have uh, so many words that you want to get out in a, in a technical paper? Do you have any goals that you work towards towards that? You know, I used to work like that. I used to, I used to make a lot of plans and a lot of goals, but um, I've learned to just let creation happen and not force it. That's kind of been like the, the key to me actually getting more traction out there and getting people to engage with me is not forcing it not trying to hit a certain mark, not trying to post every single day, not trying to overload people with information, but just try to be real. You know, I don't, I don't want to look like a bot. <laughs> I don't want to look like a bot out there just pumping out content like I have some sort of, uh, you know, machine behind me. This is coming from me. It's me actually reading that article in the morning and, and just sharing it with y'all. And then, so, so long as I keep doing that, I, I think I'll hopefully continue to have success and hopefully be able to, to help people and you know, it'll pay me pay back in dividends when people say, hey, John, you know, I read that article you sent and it really helped me out with this project or, um, you know, I, that job you shared that, you know, I got that job, you know, like that, those types of things actually have started to happen in my life just from sharing on social media. And it's, uh, it's been really cool to watch. So I've been enjoying it. I will say personally, that's one of the most rewarding things for me as well. When somebody says, hey, I actually used something that you put out there. It feels real good. It makes you feel like you're really doing what you're supposed to be doing. And, you know, in the second half of my career, this is what it's all about. It's about helping and giving back to others, creating good products, and just, again, like being there for people, you know, helping. It's, it's important. I try to encourage people to find the trade organization that represents their industry and volunteer for that. There's just so much knowledge. There's a wealth of experience that whether you're a couple of days in the industry or years in the industry, there is a place and a need for you. So with that being said, how did you go from a member to a leader in IATMO? From a member to a leader? Well, I started out on one of the task groups, actually. So I, I, I'm, I hooked up with Christoph online, another social media guru, and uh, him and I linked up right away. And we, we knew together that him and I would work together on some interesting projects. So he brought me into the fold, actually. And uh, this was while I was working at the hospital. You know, I was encouraged working at the hospital to get involved in some of these projects and help the industry grow in terms of uh, health and safety. So that's kind of how I got involved. It was more of a, I guess, voluntold through the hospital <laughs> in, in some regard to, to get involved with some of these, some of these external organizations. And then, uh, and then you find out that you're in the right room and you, you're, you know, th these are your people and, and you're talking to the right group. And once I, once I made it to that group and, you know, I stayed, I, I was, I was hooked. So I knew once, once we started making, making documents that I was like, this is, this is where I want to be. I, I want to make things that are going to last a long time that are going to be in this industry, maybe outlast me. And this is one way I can do it. So when the opening came up to join the team and work with Christoph and be on his team, I had to jump at it. And we, uh, we've, been doing, we've been doing good work together ever since. So it's been about a year now. And it's, it's been a lot of fun. Any tips for people out there or companies out there that are simply just paying the dues and they're not getting anything out of their trade organizations? It's very hard to get volunteers to, to do extra, especially when things are busy right now, you know, but I think what IATMO does differently is we do provide them with the resources that they need. So I think when these groups have volunteers and the volunteers maybe aren't paying their dues, as, as you said, or, or, or participating in, in writing the standards or reviewing the standards, maybe by providing them with additional tools and additional help or access to those tools through membership, 
will help them engage in, in, in writing the next version or the next iteration of it. Sometimes people don't even realize that these documents exist. So having the library in front of them maybe gives somebody an option to review something and say, well, you know, I have something to say about that. And maybe that starts a whole new group or a whole new task group or a whole new committee. And, you know, we go back to the drawing board. And, that, and that's kind of the beauty of codes and standards. And, and it's, it's constantly changing. You know, it's, it's always changing. And, and we, have to, we have to look at it that way. So if somebody were trying to check out a trade organization, let's say specifically IATMOS, and they were looking at all the content in the library, what are some of the things that they'll find? One of the things you'll find is the answers in an analysis portal. So we have a uniform plumbing code and the uniform mechanical code. And both of those code groups have the answers and analysis code committee. So online, you can go onto iatmo.org and you could submit a code question. And the code question comes directly through me um, and it gets processed through the committee. I'm staff liaison on those groups. And the committee will answer the question in a thorough response. And it's been used in so many different ways uh, throughout the industry to really help finish projects or maybe integrate something new that maybe an inspector hasn't seen before, perhaps. So it's been a, it's been a tool that the industry has been using. And, and it's been, that's something that, that I think the members get access to that non-members do not, is that answer analysis database. So that's a nice tool to have. Yeah, definitely. If you're paying for a membership, you should go to the website and check out all the things that you probably don't know that you now have access to. Yep, for sure. And there's a lot of content. I mean, uh, IATMO has a, has a great group of volunteers who've worked on a lot of awesome uh, publications over the years, and, and it's stocked there in our library. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot to use. I was a member of the Association of Water Technologies Board for several years, and I just got so frustrated that we would work on things, the committees would work on things, and nobody would know about it. That was one of the reasons that I started this podcast, just to create a voice that, hey, go look at this stuff. So I know that it is frustrating when things are out there and people don't know about it. So I guess that's the plea from both of us. If you're paying dues somewhere, go figure out what you're paying those dues for. And there's probably so much more information out there than you realize that you now have access to. It'll more than pay for whatever you're paying for in dues. Absolutely. And plus, you have access to the group who wrote it. You know, the, you, you can really, uh, you can hear the intention. You can, you could sit down and speak with the committee who put the proposal together or, or whatnot. And, uh, you know, it, it does get you access to the inside. It's, it's an organization made up of plumbers and manufacturers and engineers, and it's, it's industry people. I mean, it's a pretty cool group to be a part of. Now, our listeners can't see this, but you've got some pretty cool equipment in front of you. You shared with me earlier before we started recording that you've been playing guitar for pretty much your entire life. Tell us about that. Yeah, I started playing guitar when I was seven. And uh, funny enough, you know, I, I played in a band for most of my life, actually. Um, almost through all my high school years, even into a little bit of college, I played in a touring band, played shows for a lot of years, singer-songwriter, put it down for a lot of years. And now I got a nine-year-old daughter who just picked it up. So we're playing and, you know, I just moved my whole family down to North Carolina from New York and we're building a little studio in the basement. We're going to have some fun. We're going to make some, some videos. So you might see us, uh, you know, on TikTok or something in the future, <laughs> doing some daddy, some daddy daughter, uh, concerts. We look forward to that. And if, if that happens, we will make sure to, to send that post to our listeners. Where in North Carolina are you? I'm down in Charlotte, South Charlotte, out in the woods. We're only a couple hours from each other. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really enjoying it down here. It's been a real change of pace, change of culture, but uh, I love it. It's all about the kids. There we go. If somebody just joined us right now and you could only get one point across to them, what would you want that point to be? I would say preserve your energy. This is a long game. You got to enjoy this process. In the beginning, I hit it hard and fast. I wanted things to come real quickly. This industry is a long game. There's a lot of ripple effects and there's a lot of a lot of nuance that needs to be known. And the only way to know that is really by getting involved. So again, participation is key. Understanding who who your stakeholders are, who your partners are. Well, we're going to shift gears just slightly and go to our lightning round questions. So these are questions that I ask of all of my guests, and we kind of compare and see how everybody answers. So question number one, if you can go back in time and talk to your former self on your first day as a technical director, what advice would you give yourself? Don't overextend yourself. 
you can't be there for everybody in every group. But if you have something to say, say it because it comes from a place of experience. And sometimes you bite your tongue. You don't want to say, say things, <laughs> you know, just because you're a new guy or you're, uh, you know, you're starting somewhere fresh in a, in a new type of business. But there's a reason they brought you to that table, you know, and I'm a plumber sitting with some really smart people all the time. So I, I oft, oftentimes feel like, uh, you know, the imposter syndrome settling in and uh, it is difficult to, to express yourself. But when you, when you do, people are actually appreciated. So that's one thing I could say uh, I'm learning. Well, same question, but what if I asked you your first day as a plumber? How would you answer that? Just enjoy the process, you know, lean into the suck, you know, <laughs> working in the trades is hard. It's really hard, you know, there's, but there's a lot of benefits to it. It's, a, it's just a great opportunity. It's a, it's a great way to build a life, but don't rush it. There's a, there's a lot of opportunities and, that, and that's what I want to share with my book and stuff too. I want to show that there's places you can go. It's not just this, you know, so lean into it, lean into the resistance. There's, there's more ahead of it. So I want to change my next question a little bit. Give us a little preview about your book. Well, I mean, I'm going to run through most of my story, which is, um, you know, starting out as a child, a <laughs> child plumber, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, how the wrench got thrown in my plans. You know, it's, uh, I don't want to get into it too much, but I had some, some health issues come up in my life that really kind of changed the path that I was on. So I, you know, I was out in the field for a lot of years and unfortunately had some health issues that really threw a wrench in my plans and kind of made me recalibrate. And I'm thankful for it, to be honest with you. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's some of, some of the uh, things I went through, I'm better for. I had some great mentors along the way that took me out, out of the field and took me under their wing and taught me the other side of the business. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been really, uh, it's been a ride. When Hollywood reads your book, and of course they want to make a movie and they write the script, who do you want playing John? Uh, I don't know if they'll make a movie about this book, but uh, <laughs> if I was going to be, you know, if, if, if they made a movie about me, I'm sure it'd be some sort of cheesy comedy. <laughs> maybe, maybe the guy who gets the, the second chance, you know, realized that, uh, you know, you've been busy chasing some things you really didn't need in life. And, uh, you know, you get that second chance. And Do you have a particular actor in mind to play that? <laughs> oh, an actor. Um, no, not, not particularly. You, you have to think about that and post that on social media when you, when you get an answer. Last question. If you could talk with anybody throughout history, who would it be with and why? Oh, well, I'm a big comedy nerd, so I'd like to have a beer with George Carlin and just talk politics. <laughs> there you I go. I think that would be an interesting conversation for today's age. Yeah. Most of the stuff that he did, you probably could not do today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a lot of what he said may, in fact, ring true as well. So it's, uh, it'll, be, it'll be really funny. It'd be a real fun conversation to have. So Absolutely. So uh, have you done some stand-up yourself? No, I'm just a big fan. I've, I've, I've gone and seen stand-up my whole life. Uh, I enjoy entertainers. I like people who have craft. I like people who write. I like people who get up and let it all out there and you know, aren't afraid to uh, express themselves. One of my mentors uh, suggests that everybody try stand up at least once at an open mic night. It uh, develops your chops a little bit. It really puts things in perspective when you think you're nervous when you go up and uh, talk to an audience. I did it, and I can tell you, he's right. Yeah, I could imagine. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm very new to the public speaking side of things. I you know I told you before I did have a little experience on stage as a musician, but um, even with this current role, I'm doing a lot more public speaking than I'm used to, and you know, getting out there and having the exposure and practicing is, <laughs> there's nothing like getting out there and doing it and just, you know, leaning into it, leaning into the resistance, feeling uncomfortable. Well, you were fantastic at the Association of Water Technologies Convention, and you were fantastic here on the Scaling Up H2O podcast. So thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing information with us. Thank you, Tracy. It was a pleasure. Nation, I met John Mullen in Vancouver when the Association of Water Technologies was having their convention there the previous year. And it's so good to bring different industries within the water treatment industry together because there's so much that we can share. Everybody has their own particular set of knowledge. And if we can freely share that knowledge throughout the different water industries, I truly believe 
There is not a problem that we cannot solve when it comes to water. So if you are looking for an event to go to where you can co-mingle with different water industries, please go to scalinguph2o.com, go over to our events page, and we've got everything for the year that we know of about water for you to decide what you want to go to, how you're going to meet new people, and what you are going to do this year. So all that on our events page, scalinguph2o.com. And I'm sure glad that I go to these conventions because I get to meet people like John. And as you've learned on this interview, John creates content. And through that content, he became very active in his association. There's so many people out there that don't think they have what it takes to help an association or to create content. And folks, let me tell you, if I can do this, you can do that. So with that, I'm going to urge you that if you are thinking about joining a particular organization, that you look into that. And then you send somebody an email within that organization letting them know you want more information and you attend whatever meeting it is so you can do that. It's one thing to belong It's another thing to contribute. It takes belonging to a whole nother level, and it allows you to learn so much more because of your involvement. And there's so many organizations out there that are looking for content, and I know that there is content in you. Now, there might also be some self-doubt in you, and you think, who is ever going to read something that I write? Well, folks, that is garbage that's in our own head, and it's very easy to listen to that. It's also very hard to take the first step, and that's what I talked about in the very beginning of this episode, and I'm sure glad I did because of all the benefits that I spoke about, so I'm urging you to do that. Take the first step and write something. Or contact somebody and say that you want to get involved, or you at least want to learn how you can get involved, what is available for you to get involved in. When you get yourself involved, when you teach other people something that you know, something magic happens. It accelerates your ability to learn about that particular topic. And then other people see you freely giving and they want to help you. It's amazing. It's been my entire career and the best advice somebody gave me when I went into business so many years ago was I needed to volunteer for the Association of Water Technologies. Now, maybe the AWT is the group that you need to join. Maybe it's another association. But the point was, I got some good advice. I'm trying to give that good advice back to pay it forward from that person from me to you. And I hope you find some place that you can give to because when you give, it's amazing what you get back. Hey, speaking of that, coming up very shortly, we have the Global 6K from Team World Vision. And that Global 6K is taking place on Saturday, May 20th. And last year, we had the Scaling Up Nation have their own team. So a lot of people, they joined with their companies. Other people, they wanted to do it on their own, but they didn't want to do it alone. So they joined Team Scaling Up. And if you want more information about the global 6K for water, you can go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash 6K. Why is it a 6K and not a 5K? Well, because the average person that does not have readily available clean drinking water is walking six kilometers to and from in order to get that water. 
We want to recognize that. We want to solve that. We want to make that so everybody has access to clean drinking water. Just imagine how your life would change if you did not have water coming out of the faucet that's probably 10 feet away from you right now. What would you have to do in your day if you had to walk six kilometers to get that water? Well, folks, when we can solve that issue, there are so many other issues that are solved, and I truly believe that we can do it, and one of the ways that we can do it is by learning more about the global water crisis and seeing what we can do, and something that we can do to do both of those things is by going to scalinguph2o.com forward slash 6k, and we can do something fun by walking, running, crawling, whatever you want to do to go six kilometers on May 20th to bring some attention to all the children in the world that do not have clean drinking water. One last time, because I know you're getting tired of me saying it, it's scalinguph2o.com forward slash 6k. We're, of course, going to be talking more about this as the year continues. But here's the cool thing about the Global 6K. So many of us are in the day-to-day, every single day of our job, and we need stuff to celebrate. And there's World Water Day, there's Industrial Water Week, but then there's this activity that allows us to not only celebrate what we do as industrial water treaters, but actually give back to the planet, give back the water that we so graciously treat. And that is the Global 6K that's taking place on May 20th. You can get your entire company involved. You can get your entire family involved. Maybe you have another group that is looking for something fun to do. So again, I said it's the last time I was going to say it. I'm going to say it one more time. ScalingUpH2O.com forward slash 6K. All the information's there. They will let you know what you need to do. A $50 donation will get you into the race. It's amazing what they can do with $50. They will send you a kit with everything that you need for the race. And you can have so much fun with all the people that you participate with. I hope that you consider that. And there's so many other organizations out there that are trying to help with the global water crisis. It's my hope that you realize that it truly is a privilege that most of us have clean drinking water. And if we did not have that, imagine how different our jobs would be. Imagine how different our lives would be. Nation, lots of things to think about today. I'm sure glad that you tuned in to the Scaling Up H2O podcast, and I will have a brand new episode for you next week. Until then, take care, everybody. Do you wish you had your very own private tutor to help you prepare for the CWT exam? If so, I've got you covered. Don't fret another minute. Go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep today and take my CWT practice exam course. The course will give you the information you need to stop worrying and start taking the next step in your professional journey. Get the private tutor you've been looking for by visiting scalinguph2o.com forward slash CWT prep.